Welcome back. Um, it's a beautiful Sunday evening. Um, don't forget to pay your tithes and offerings. I forgot my note this evening. Uh, don't forget to pay your tithes and offerings. Do we still have that clip? No. You can text to give or you can give online. Um, I announced that this morning. Maybe we'll put it up later. Anyway, it's so glad. It's so good to have you all this evening. Everybody online, it's good to have you all too. Sorry for the technical delay. Uh, my phone was not turned sideways. Um, there we go. Text to give. Uh, you can text GIVE to 205-732-8249, and you can give online at our Kindred Giving uh, website. It's app slash giving slash Butler First. And um, don't forget to pay your tithes and offerings, but thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we're going to worship, and then Brother Broadhead is going to come up with a wonderful message. So let's pray, and then we'll worship. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for bringing us back to your house. and. God, I pray that you would just move in a mighty way tonight. And we love you and we thank you. And I just pray that you would just continue to bless our church and continue to touch Brother Fulcher and Miss Phyllis, Lord. Uh, continue to strengthen them and uh, help the healing process along. And uh, we just thank you for who you are, Lord. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us? i 
you so much for your, your presence, Father. There literally is nothing sweeter than your name. God, I thank you for the ability just to sit and to enjoy just your presence. God, there's nothing sweeter. to move as we move into this next phase of the service. God, I pray that you will continue to move. And God, if there's anybody in this room tonight that feels like maybe you're not the sweetest and your present presence isn't the sweetest, God, I pray that by the end of the night they would know that there's nothing like you. God, whether that person be online or whether they're sitting in this room like right now, God, I pray that they would feel your power I would feel your love. God, minister in a mighty way. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. All right. Tonight we have Brother Broadhead. He's going to speak to us. And I know it's going to be a wonderful. Um, you can just come on up if you want to. Um, I have one more announcement. It says six kids participated in the Epic Give Day today, and that was BGMC. Is that right? That's awesome. And they gave, hold on, they gave $555. That's what I'm talking about. All right. That's awesome. All right, Brother Broadhead, here's your microphone. Hold on now. I forgot to do this this morning. I got one right here. Oh, you got one? All right. Oh, you already got one on. All right, then. Let me put this Clorox back in there. All right. Well, is this one it. on? This one's on. Yeah, it is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we were at another first assembly this morning, but it's good to be home tonight. Amen. It was, we hadn't been home much here, and some of you hadn't been here much either, but we're here tonight. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, pastor and these other preachers and teachers have been streaming. But this is my first. So I just look at you and say hello to the pastors and we'll be glad when y'all are back. Amen. Well, God has just been so good through it all, hasn't he? It's good to see each one here tonight and that the Lord is keeping on, keeping on. His arm is not short, that he can't reach out and save and heal and do anything he ever could do. If we can believe him for it, if we will believe him for it, God's a great God. Got a message I want to share with you tonight out of the book of Luke, chapter 19. One of the parables of Jesus. This is a parable. I guess we could name it either the nobleman's ten pounds or the parable of the ten pounds. Now this parable is very similar sounding to the parable of the talents. But it's different. It has a different perspective and a, and a little different message. Because in the parable of the talents found in about Matthew 25, each one of the servants was given a specific amount of uh, talents that was a little different than the others. And uh, we may can relate to that a little better than what we're going to be talking about tonight. But in this parable of the pounds, 
or in some uh, versions it's called minus or silver or uh, one of the notes in one of the Bibles that I looked in and was studying in said that it was an amount equivalent to about a three months wages for a laborer. I know what a laborer was and is. That was my one and only job at the paper mill <laughs> was a laborer. And they did whatever. <laughs> they labored as long as you could get them to labor. And at least I was young then. But this was a, is a parable that the Lord's just been kind of putting on my heart at least a phrase that is found in this parable that I believe we can all relate to. The parable of the pounds was a parable where ten servants were given the exact same amount to begin with. They were all given one talent or the equivalent of three months' wages for our labor. And the nobleman that is in the parable gave to each one of these one pound and told them that he wanted them to do something with it. Let me just read a few verses there several verses in this parable. I won't read them all right now, but in chapter 19 of Luke, verses 11 through 27, we find the parable of the ten pounds. Again, ten servants were given one pound each and were told to do something with it. It kind of reminds me of, of a part of the preamble in our country's declaration that says all men are created equal. We all were, in a great sense of the word. We weren't all born in the same circumstances or in the same family, but we were all born without a stitch of clothing on us. We were born needing someone to slap us and get our breath started. We were all born very equal in, in many ways. When I look at this parable, I see ten man, men or servants that are given equal amounts and are asked to do something with it while the nobleman is away. Because at some point, the nobleman's going to come back. Let's read a few verses in the 19th chapter beginning at verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because, and this is important, that they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went in to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Verse 13, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Now this is the phrase that jumps out at me. And I'm reading out of the King James Version. 
So it says, occupy pie till I come. I'm going to stop right there for right now. Occupy till I come. I don't believe that I have heard as much preached and talked about concerning the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ in the past 10 years as I've heard about in the last four months. Now there's always been those who would preach about the coming of the Lord sporadically from time to time. There's been those who sort of, uh, 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 you know, were experts, quote, in the areas of prophecy and would talk more about the second coming of Christ, the rapture, the the tribulation, the um, revelation or the second phase of the coming of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ. Hadn't heard a whole lot about that yet, but I've been thinking a lot about it. And, uh, and also the eternities where time will be no more. But lately since the pandemic, plague, virus, whatever you want to call it, We've been hearing more about the coming of Christ. And I think that's a good thing. I do believe that we're living in the last days. However, I believe we've been living in the last days ever since the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. But we're just in the last of the last days right now. I believe that. But as I look at this passage, I see that Jesus was wanting to get across to his disciples that the kingdom of God is coming and is on the scene. But what you're relating to the kingdom of God is the fact that God is going to take over in the present world and all other governments are going to be wiped out, and that's going to happen immediately. Jesus wanted to let them know it may not be immediately. There's some things that we pray about, and we look the next day to see if they've happened, and they hadn't, and we get discouraged because they haven't immediately happened. Well, even over in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, we see that as Jesus was speaking to his disciples and the apostles and those that were around him, he spoke these words in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 1 of the book of Acts. We're going to go back to Luke 19, but right there in the book of Acts, chapter 1, Verses 6 through 8, it says, When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Wilt thou at this time, right now? And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, It is not for you to know the times are the seasons which the Father has put in His own power. But ye, and we're so familiar with this verse, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So when Jesus is talking to the disciples then and back here in Luke where we just read, Jesus is saying, I am coming back. The parable was about a nobleman going away 
for a given period of time and taking his kingdom to the place that it would eventually be where he would take complete control. Now we know that God is in complete control now. But a lot of times it doesn't look like it, right? But in this parable, the nobleman was going to a far country to receive for himself the kingdom and then return. I don't know how many places in the Bible that when Jesus is speaking, he's saying, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. I will return. Peter even says that there would be a day where people would say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since our fathers have died, we have heard that he's coming back and we don't believe he's coming back. And I paraphrase that part. But Peter said that God or the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as men count slackness. So if I feel and I believe that Jesus could come back any day, any hour, any moment in regards to the rapture, then what am I to be doing right now? And with everything looking so much like the signs of the time that were given in Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and places in Mark and other places in the scripture in Paul's writings what are we to do knowing that the Lord could come back at any moment at any time well I I, there's been times in my life my Christian life my ministry that I have felt more like the Lord was about to come back than I had at others but that didn't mean he was more likely to come back when I felt like he would come back than when I didn't feel like he would come back. I'm more prone based on scripture to believe that the Lord will come back when we're least expecting it. Not when we're most expecting it. So it's very important that I stay ready and not just get ready, get ready, get ready. T.D. Jakes says that. But it's more important that I stay ready. And what was Jesus teaching here? He's saying that after a little while, I'm going to go away. I'm going to be gone for a season. I'm going to be gone for a while. Uh, And he didn't say how long. But he said to these ten servants that he gave the ten pounds to occupy Till I come. Do something with what I've given you until I get back. He didn't give him a date. He didn't give him a date or a time. I've heard a lot lately that relating to the coming of the Lord and the rapture, um, connecting it to the Feast of Trumpets. There are other names to that, but that's the easiest one to pronounce. That will actually take place next Saturday into Sunday. Are you ready if the rapture were to take place next Saturday into Sunday? I'll tell you one thing. I'd be glad I came to church today. (laughs) Amen. I'd be glad. But I'd mostly be glad that I had given my heart to Jesus and he had washed my sins away. Well, what am I to do between now and next Sunday? And what if the Lord don't come 
next Saturday or Sunday. And we're still here. We're saying, wow. Well, maybe it's going to be Yom Kippur, which is 10 days from the uh, Feast of Trumpets. And that'll be around the first of next month. What, what are we to do? Jesus said, occupy till I come. Now let's zero in on that word occupy a little bit. Occupy is a military term or a military word. It means to take possession of by settlement or seizure. Uh, back when my great-great-grandpa came into Choctaw County, he just staked him off about 100 acres of land or more. And uh, there's a lot of folks around here that had the same, same great-great-grandpas I did. We had different grandpas, but we had the same great-great-grandpa. And there's a lot around. But he just staked him off some land and settled. He just settled in it. Said, I want this hundred, I want this hundred acres. Or how many acres it was. And there's a lot of the land around here, that's the way that it came into being in our families. Somebody, one of them great or great greats or great great back there. Uh, came in and staked the land. Said, this, I'm going to build me a house and I'm going to live here. It's called homesteading. There's still something called homestead exemption on your taxes and mine and we'll have to pay before too long. Homestead exemption. Homesteaded it. That's one way to occupy the land. Is to come in and say, I'm claiming this land for my family. And now, a lot, it kind of turns around, and many of us are saying, as we're praying and interceding, I'm claiming my family for this land. The land of promise. The land of, of the Lord. The land heaven. Claiming my family for that land. So settling in a land is one way to occupy land. And uh, that's what Israel did, the nation of Israel. And God told Moses, he told Joshua, that every bit of the land that your foot steps on is going to be yours. Boy, if we could get that today, we'd be a bunch of us out there running around, wouldn't we? We wouldn't even be in church tonight. We'd be out there trying to claim our land. <laughs> if somebody said, every, every bit of the land that your foot touches is yours. Just like a lot of folks, you know, they're, they're satisfied only when they own the land that connects with theirs. Can't, can't really get enough. Settlement, settling in. There's a good spiritual truth to that. Folk, we need to be settling in to this land around us, claiming it for Jesus Christ, claiming it for the Lord, claiming it for revival, claiming it for an awakening, claiming it for a, a move of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen before in our entire lives. Some of us that's a little older have seen some pretty powerful moves of God. Then there's another way that we can take possession of land. That's by seizure. That's usually a, mil that's a military term. You've got to take it by fighting for it. I, I will remind us, and we all know it, that the devil don't want to give up an inch. He's come in 
and illegally claimed the property that is God's for himself and made a mess out of it. Starting with Adam and Eve. Satan has claimed the land for himself. Now, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not going to say exactly where the virus came from except that I know where it originated. And that's in hell. This virus that's going on originated in hell. That's where all sickness originated. In hell, but it came through the avenue of sin. When man sinned, sickness entered into the world. And so that's where all of this is. But, folk, we can sit down and we can say, well, I believe the devil's got the upper hand now. Got the pastor down, pastor's wife running all over the place trying to figure out all the things that are going on. And the church folks, is hiding or running from the virus. I'm too old not to say what the Holy Spirit puts in my heart to say tonight. Now, we, we, we need to be as cautious as we can be, but fear must not rule the hour. Faith must rule the hour. How do we know that we even have faith unless we need to have faith. Hope is not hope if we can see what we're hoping for. Faith in God is great and greater. And the Bible says in Matthew 11 and 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. That's in the Bible. Again, it's in Matthew eleven twelve. 12. And it says from the days of John the Baptist until Till now. The now was when the Bible was written, being written, that was written, but it is even until now as the Word of God has been fulfilled even today. That the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Satan does not want to give up an inch of the land that he has illegally taken away from God and God's people. But God has said that the, the violent take it by force. Now there's an element of settling in and claiming the property or the families or the souls for God wherever we may be going. Now, one of the unique things about this pandemic, plague, virus, whatever it is, is God still working in people's lives even calling folks to the mission field. He's still speaking. Satan does not have the upper hand on what's going on right now. He does not. God is speaking to people right now. I, I'm a little old, older than I used to be. But since churches have started gathering together, me and my wife has been in church. I've been preaching almost every Sunday. That's why I haven't been here when you were having Sunday services a lot of times. Every Sunday. And the devil told me several years ago, you're done. And I'm beginning to doubt him now. We're none of us done because the word of God that I've read tonight in this parable says occupy till I come. Has he come yet? 
I know he hasn't. Some people believe he has. And that is a, that is a very false doctrine to say the least. I even had a guy come in one of the churches I was pastoring a few years back and uh, he, he said, I'd like to talk to your congregation. This was after church. He said, I'd like to talk to your congregation. And I talked to him a little bit and we talked and he said, I believe the rapture's already taken place. And there we all were in the church. Now, I wouldn't doubt there'd be a few left in the church when the rapture takes place, but not everybody. <laughs> and so he said, I'd really like to talk to your folks. I said, you come by my office this week and we'll talk. He never did come by and I never saw him again. But there's some people that would claim in various ways, and I'm not going through all the, what they, how they believe that and explain it and all, but they believe the rapture has already taken place. No, it hasn't. I'm here. You're here. The blood of Jesus is still powerful and working, and people are still getting saved in this country and in other countries. He said, occupy till I come. So there is a, a way of possessing, a way of possessing the land by settlement, selling in and claiming it for God. You, like you claim Butler, you claim Toxie, you claim Needham, you claim Choctaw County, you claim your family in the, through the name of Jesus by faith and you plead the blood over them and you pray for them on a regular basis. That's like settlement. I'm just settling it. God's word is settled. I believe it. It's so, and I'm going to stand on it. But then there are spiritual battles. Many of us have been going through some kind of spiritual battles. Especially with the virus going around, things like that, there was... We don't do it so much right now, but there was a time me and my wife, every evening, you know, older folks get feeling a little down, a little, little rough in the evenings, especially if they get out and do anything. And, and they feel kind of rough, and we'd sit in those chairs, and I'd, I'd say to my wife, I said, do I have a fever? You know, feel me. See, if I got a fever, sometimes she'd say, do I have a fever? And we never did have no fever. <laughs> but we just felt it. You just feel it. I do want you to understand this virus is real. I believe it's real. I know it's real. My son, his wife, and his entire family had it right after we were around them. But we didn't spend the night with them. But God is faithful. God is faithful. What are we to do during this time? Jesus said, taught in this parable, occupy. Now you're occupying some space tonight. Even those that are watching are occupying space somewhere. We're occupying that space. But are we occupying that space filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Filled with the Word of God? Filled with the direction of God? In our lives. Occupy till I come. Do something with what God has given us until he comes. And to begin with, we all were born. And we were born, as Job says, naked. And we had nothing. And that's the way we're going to go out. So we've got a lot of similarities going on. God gave everybody something. But not everybody realizes the value and the potential and the fulfillment of that that God has placed within us. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I haven't come near to the place in God that God has intended for me to come in my own self. I've realized a few gifts. But I've also realized that there were other people that had more gifts than I did and had, 
and were better at the gift that I had than I was. Now you, you know what I'm talking about. That happens to all of us at some time or another as human beings. But the nobleman came back and I believe he was talking in this parable to everybody that was listening. But he only chose ten servants to give the silver coin to. But there were only three in the parable that he approached to see how they did. I'm sure everybody else got their feelings hurt. (laughs) But he came to one guy and he said, well, let me read it. He came to the first in verse 16, that same chapter 19 of Luke. And the first fellow said, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Here's what the Lord said to him in verse 17. Well, thou good servant, because thou have been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Now that's when I start thinking into the millennial reign of Christ and into the eternities and what God's got for us to do. Amen. Young people need to really get a grip on the Word of God today. We need to help them every way we can because when they look at this world, they're thinking, well, I don't have a future. I I can study, I can go to school, I can do this or I can do that get all my training in and then either the Lord's going to come or tribulation or something and I'm not even going to get to use it. Friend, this life, and we know this up here, I hope we can get it down to here, this life is not all there is to it. As a believer, as a Christian, as a person who believes in an everlasting and eternal life, This life is not all there is to it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life we we have hope only, we are most men, all men most miserable. We don't just have hope for this life. We've got hope in this life and in the life to come. There's a lot more out there than what we can even imagine or the Bible even describes. A lot of it is mystery, mysterious, and taken by faith as we walk with God. But he tells this man that took that one pound, turned it into ten. Good for you. Now you did a little, and it don't matter how much we do on this earth. As a child of God, it's still little compared to to the glories of God. He said, you've done a little, and that's good, and I'm going to make you, give you ten cities to be over. Now, every now and then, lately, I've been thinking about, Lord, what am I going to be doing later on? Because I'm not sure about after the next ten years of life on this earth for me. But there's more. I'm thinking, Lord, I know I hadn't done all that great, but maybe you'll just let me fill in the gaps. I don't believe in purgatory. I believe everything you do down here is to be done to get ready to go there. But this ain't all it is to it. This life is not all it is to it. Well, I've had a lot on my mind in this message today. I'll be honest with you, it's the second time my wife's heard it. But she's here. I told her tonight, I said, it's going to be different. And you can tell me how different (laughs) when we get through. This has been the message on my heart before I knew I was even going to preach here tonight. We had our dates a little crossed, but we got them straightened out. and We're on on roll now. But this is the only message God gave me today. And it's occupy till I come. Now there was another fella that was given five pounds 
And in verse 18, the second came saying, Lord, thy pound has gained five. Five times what you gave me, that's what I have to give you back. And what the Lord say? He said it was good and he said, I'll give you, make you over five cities. One thing I want to bring out before I move on is the Lord didn't reprimand the guy that did five times as well with what he had for not doing ten times as well. That's one reason I know when I stand before the Lord, Jesus won't say, why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Because I didn't have ten to start with, you know. We all had one, though. Some of us are just better at producing, reproducing, letting God reproduce. See, that's all I've ever been is what God reproduced and made real and come alive in my life. It ain't what I did. Oh, I admit there were times I thought it was. But it never was. It's what God did in me, made life, made real in my life and the fellow that came five was just as the, the Lord the nobleman was just as proud of him apparently in the word of God who was a guy that made his ten times over now there's one other one that he approached and another one came in verse 20 saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound. I was going to get a, some kind of big silver coin to wrap it up in my handkerchief, but I forgot to do that. So here's my handkerchief, and it's clean. I hadn't used it, but this fella that got one, just like everybody else did, said, here is thy pound which I have kept laid up in this napkin all this time. I just kept it here. I still got it. I still got what you gave me. I don't know what he was expecting. But he went on to describe why he did that. He said, For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. I don't know how many of you got lost in the King James there, but go on to verse 22, he says, And he saith unto him, Out of your own mouth I will judge thee, thou wicked servant. Now call the other two, well, they called one of them good, and he, uh, by his expression, uh, saw that the other one was good as well. But this is totally different. He said, thy wicked servant. Still his servant, but he's a wicked one. Kind of reminds me of the scripture that's been quoted so much that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. My people. Does God's people have any wicked ways? Evidently so. This is a servant still. But he said, Thy wicked servant, thou knewest I was an austere man, taking up that which I had not laid down and reaping that I did not sow. And then he goes on to say to him why didn't you give the money to the bank at least and get some interest on it do something simple make a few dollars increase you know when we're born and God endues us in our DNA with some abilities maybe that are special some people there's no doubt about it that it's just a gifting from birth, birth when they sit down and six, seven, eight, nine years old and they 
play something on the piano, another instrument by some great composer. And they didn't learn to do it. It just was a gifting. There's some things like that. We've all been given something. See, the Lord is saying to us today and tonight, I don't want you just to take what I give you and sit on it. Did that sound a little austere? <laughs> that word was in there. I, I don't want you to take just what I gave you and sit on it. And I look out and I see people who didn't do that. They're increasing in God. They're increasing in their abilities. They're saying yes beyond their natural inclinations. But you know what I feel I've kind of come up with? This guy that wrapped his coin up in a, in a napkin and I don't know if he hid it in a drawer or buried it in the backyard or what he did with it, but you know what I've come up with him? About him, he was a perfectionist. You say, wow. I'm not sure I get that, or maybe you do get it. He was a perfectionist. Now, a perfectionist isn't someone that does everything perfect. They just think it ought to be done perfect. Man, that's right. Our perfection, and I got a little bit of that in me. And I'm a long way off from doing things perfectly. But there's certain things that I have to watch myself about because I may not know how to do it, but I know if it's done right or not. It's kind of a bad position to be in. And if we're not careful, we can become very critical in that area being a perfectionist I think this guy was a perfectionist and the reason he didn't do anything with what he had because he looked around and he saw people that could do it better than he could now that's good I don't know if you think that's good or not but I think that's good that's why he didn't do what he anything he said on what he had because he saw people that could do it better than he could and so he said I'm not going to do it I'm not even going to try that because I know I can't do it as good as them there are people all over the place that could have been great in whatever God gifted them in but they wouldn't step out because they were not number one every time the trophies were passed out I know that people, I know of people that quit sports early on, not because they weren't good, but because they weren't the best. they are people that have stopped other things, like learning to play the piano. I did that. <laughs> because they were not the best. And they couldn't do it as good as someone else or play certain musical uh, pieces that others could play better. And they just sat on it. Man, it's not a time to sit on it. It is time for me to quit. But it's not time to sit on what God has given us to do. What do we do in all of this commotion that's going on. Me and my wife went to Meridian the other day and I told her, I said to her, it's not as fun going to town anymore as it used to be, is it? Why? Because you go up to a restaurant and you're not sure if they're open for inside, uh, you know, you can go inside or if you got to get it from the outside, call in, get an app, or, or if you can... Go in and sit down. Everybody's going to be stretched out or everybody's going to be back to back. 
I've been in both of those, all of those settings over the past few weeks and months. You just don't know. Sometimes we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. But tonight, God is saying to my heart, and I believe to the church, this is what I want you doing. Occupy till I come. Believe that I come. And, and we're in the last days. And I, he could come any moment. But don't sit down and quit doing because you think the Lord might come next weekend. I don't know. I don't study. I haven't. I think it's real interesting. It kind of catches my attention a little more today than it used to. But Jewish traditions and things of that nature and the feast and all that, they're all biblical. I don't, and I, I like, I listen to a lot of, I, have you listened to a lot of preachers lately? Man, you can listen to 10 in one hour and never hear one of them through. Just get a little of this one, oh, that's good, well, and, and then go to another one and say, well, I, and then go to another one. I've done it. Maybe you've done it. I've seen some. I, I mean, there's some, there some guys preaching under the anointing that's right on where we are in, in times right now. But there's some other guys that I think they must be way behind. Some of them are way ahead. We need to listen. We need to stay in the Word. This is where it's at. This, this is, if we will get in the Word and stay in the Word, this is exciting a material as you can handle in this life if you'll let it get in you. Occupy till it comes. The Lord wasn't happy with the one who folded his pound up and put it in the cabinet or in the ground or whatever he did with it. And verse 26, Jesus said, For I say unto you that unto everyone that hath shall be given and from him that hath not even it shall be taken from him so what had happened prior to that is uh, the Lord told one of the other servants get that one that that guy buried and give it to the one that had ten times greater than what he started out with to him that hath it shall be given God knows what he can trust me with. He knows what he can trust you with. It will do us no good whatsoever in this time or any other time sit around and wonder why God used somebody else like he did and he used us like he did. And it wasn't like he used those others. The, the, the nobleman did not compare the one that had ten times over to the one that had five times over. But he was not pleased with the one that buried what he had. What had. God has blessed us. God has blessed us. Many of you here I've seen use your giftings and your talents for the Lord. Some people would say, well, I'm a and I know I'm not talking about the talents necessary tonight, but some would say, I've got one gift, and that's all I got. Are we using it to the greatest ability that we possibly can? I dare say every one of us got more than one. And if we'll give them to God, He can make a lot more out of it. Occupy till I come. Now, you that are here tonight, you have occupied a seat in this service. You may not think that's much, but 
this a whole lot nowadays. It's a lot. It's a lot. And if you that are listening tonight from somewhere else are staying in this book in the Word of God and hearing the true preaching and teaching the Word of God that comes out of this book, you're occupying tonight. You're occupying. I'm occupying. I'm doing things. I'm doing things tonight that uh, a month or two ago I I thought I'd about done with. Matter of fact, uh, a day or two ago I might have thought I was done with it. But if God keeps opening doors and leading you then God's not done yet. God knows what's out there. God wouldn't open doors that He wasn't going to send you through. And I just think right now, Butler First Assembly, Thomasville First Assembly, whatever First Assembly, Second Assembly, Third Assembly, Church of God, whoever we may be, as the saints of the living God need to rise up and occupy till He comes. Keep doing. We don't have to do the same thing we used to do. I'm not doing the same thing I used to do. But I'm doing something. God's got greater things for you and me. It's not over. The Lord hadn't come back yet. The rapture hadn't taken place yet. If He don't come next weekend, well, we'll look for Him the next day. If He don't come ten days from next weekend at Yom Kippur, we'll just keep looking for Him to the end of the year. This year ain't like no other year I've ever lived. And I've lived several. This year's different. The coming of the Lord is near, but I don't know how near. So what are we to do? Occupy. Keep doing what God's given you to do. Keep being obedient to God. Keep, keep walking through open doors. If the door closes, don't stand there and beat on it. Turn around and look for a window. Or wait on another door. God's good tonight. He's saying, this is not over. This church is not done. This pastor's not done. This pastor's wife's not done. I tell you, I look for greater anointing than we have seen in this place when the storm settles. Amen. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you're here. And I know God's got something in store. And I'm glad you had to sit down and quit, Melissa. I didn't know who she is behind her mask. We hadn't. We, we encourage people through Facebook, through media, through whatever. If you're not a telephone person, you got a whole bunch of other ways to do it now. Where you work, where you shop. I said this morning, I ain't never seen a time where the Holy Ghost needs to show up at Walmart any more than right now. Now, I, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but I, I believe it's true, and there may be some other places just like that. We need to be full of the Spirit of God and not only occupy with our personality and our presence, but wherever we go, occupy with the full Holy Spirit and presence of Almighty God. Would you stand with me tonight? Oh, how-
how good it is to worship. And I, you know, we were worshiping tonight as they were singing. And, oh, it was so good. Let's don't forget that we've had a long run of not being able to be together. And when we get together, let's enjoy it. We were with our family last weekend, our children, grandchildren. And we don't get to do that very often, but we, we just rented this big old house. At least it ended up our son-in-law did it. But this big old house and around the water, and it was wonderful. And the most wonderful part was just having all of our grandchildren, every one of them, all of our children there. That was marvelous. And I, the first day that I got there, I said, man, I got to try to figure out how to soak this in. It's only going to be three or four days. I got to figure out how to make it count. And I tried to do that. But I still wouldn't mind doing it this week again. But we're not, as far as I know. Oh, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together with our brothers and our sisters in the Lord? Man, it's been a long time since I've seen some of you because we've either been over yonder, over there, up yonder, somewhere. It's good to be home. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. It's good to be able to worship together. And we're believing and we don't know what we might have to wade through to get there. But we're believing it's not going to be long until we'll all be together again in ways beyond our foggiest imaginations. Oh, but when we come to church, worship like we hadn't worshipped in four months. I know some of us have been together from time to time during that time, but just like, oh, like this might be the last opportunity. You know, it was hard for us in the Western world to imagine how quickly things could shut down until four months ago. How quickly you couldn't go here, you couldn't go there you had to do this or had to do that and we're one of the blessed states in the union to be able to gather like we are tonight without retribution of any kind we're blessed 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 I'm blessed you're blessed we're so blessed tonight Y'all pick something out and sing good and while we worship. Just worship. If you want to come to the altar and worship, you can do that. If you want to worship where you are. If you can use 
But one thing that came to me this morning is I was preaching over in Thomas Hill. You know, the Lord can use our strength. He knows the strength that we have. But you know what? He can even use our weaknesses. Guess what? He's used people's handicaps. Think about it. I know some of the greatest witnesses and people are, have testimonies of people who we normal folks, whatever that is, would call handicapped. And yet they're going all over. God used them mightily to see souls saved and brought in the kingdom of God. Folks, we, might, we all have weaknesses, but God can use our weaknesses just like He can use our strengths. And sometimes He may be able to use them better. He can use our handicaps. And we're all handicapped in some way or another. God can use it. Sing out another time or two and we'll go home. as we go. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your anointing in this place tonight. Father, we ask you to go with each one of us to our respective homes and jobs. Just let your mighty hand rest upon us as we go forth to occupy till you come. Whenever that is, Lord, we want to be found serving the Lord with everything that is within us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.